Well, God is good and all the time, right? We don't know what he's all up to, uh, but we're ready to let him do it, right? However it looks. Because yeah. it may not look like yesterday's revival. I always think about that when I preached last Sunday on heaven and God's still creating. I think I look at the world and all that he's created. And what did you guys come, Stephen, you guys looked it up real quick. How many types of trees? You know, something like 40,000 trees, different varieties on the world of different types of trees. You're probably lucky if you can name five. <laughs> but God never runs out of ideas. And if he's done that down here, certainly it's true. Eyes not seen nor ear heard the things that lay in store for those that love him. Wow. He's got all kinds of ideas and ways of moving and doing, and I just don't want to limit him or restrict him on anything in any way that he wants to move. As long as it's him, we'll let him go. Amen? Yeah. A man by the name of Gene Edwards had written this. Is it my studied judgment that some future generation will deem this to be the darkest century in spiritual depth and spiritual experience in church history? That is, unless something very radical happens along soon. More corrupt than the dark days before Luther, more impotently intellectual than during the heydays of Calvinism, more financially perverted than the days that caused John the Baptist to explode, more intoxicated with the drive for spiritual power than any age, yet exercising that outward power with less internal transformation than anyone since King Saul, enamored with the gifts, yet hardly knowing the giver. Our age has produced the most commercial, materialistic, fad-oriental people ever to claim his name. Is this assessment a little too harsh? I would respond to you by pointing to one last trophy this age may win. We seem to be the more totally blind to the deprivation of our spiritual depth than all other centuries lumped together. It is true we have built more buildings and founded more religious organizations than all the, parts, all the past eras combined. It's true that today's Christianity has won more men to Christ than all other ages combined, but it is also just as true that those converts have set new records for the short length of time that they have followed the Lord with abandoned devotion. If past church history is any guide, we can optimistically look for some sort of turnaround. Spiritual depth is due for a return. May God see fit to so bless us in an age of such spiritual shallowness. Gene Edwards. Pretty powerful and poignant statements he makes, but so 100% accurate. The sad part of all that is, is he just passed away this last December at the age of 90. But what a letter, what a word. It makes us as a church and as a people to pause and take a look inward and check ourselves out and then check our church out. Are we doing it right? Are we moving in the right direction? What a challenge that we have when we change the words of that one song that we just sang, So Arise, the original song was written, So Arise from Your Rest. But that's not spiritually accurate. Solomon was the one, if you remember right, that, that made that prayer and declaration. And he said, So Arise to Your Rest. Because he said that after the temple was built and the Holy of Holies. So when we sing that, we're saying, Arise to your rest. Take your throne in our hearts and in our lives and corporately in our church. 
because certainly we want him to be the head of it all. So in the past, I'm, I'm kind of picking up on the series that I've been preaching on Friday nights. And the last two Fridays, God had different plans and uh, he took the pulpit. And that's always okay with me. I was ready, ready for him to do it here this morning to see what he wants to do. And boy, it's just a, he does a whole lot more in a few moments than what we could ever do in a lifetime. And I just rather see God move and embrace his people because in a, in a God hug, things kind of come out of us, right? The old dirt and the garbage, the junk comes out when the purity of his presence pushes in. And that's, that's what we're looking for. Isn't that what revival is all about? Is God pushing in and flesh leaving? So as I was looking at these things and contemplating the uh, two of the messages that I preached, the first one was on going after the, the glory of God, and the second one was the fire of God. And one thing I recognize is that anything in God, the only thing in God that falls in your lap is salvation. That's the only thing. He just dropped. I mean, you don't have to contend for it. You just have to believe. Reach out and receive, and he comes in, and in a moment, your life is transformed by the mighty power of the incoming Spirit of God as he takes the throne, at least as much of it as we'll give him. He wants it all. And that's the only thing that falls in love. Everything, everything after that is contended for. It has to have a purpose. We have to have a, an intensity, a, 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 a reason for going and doing what we're doing. There has to be a reason for, go why, why do we even go to church? What's our, our, our reason for going to church when we go? It has to be, I'm hungry, I need an encounter with God, and, and I need the help of the brothers and sisters to, to help me along that journey, because sometimes I don't feel like I can make the next step, but I have a brother or sister that comes alongside that can stretch forth a hand and help lift me up to the next level. We need each other yes. to get to where we're going. Yeah. And then when we get there, we're going to need each other to sustain it and move to the next level to where he wants to take us to. I just now come to my mind that event that took place in my life way back in the beginning, probably the first five years of our uh, full-time ministry down in uh, up, the, going up the Rogue River. And God did got me up bright and early in the morning at that camp. There was no, the, the only power was by a generator, so at night it shut off, and the only heat, it was in, in uh, I think in October, so it's a little chilly in the mountains in October, so you heat your cabins by uh, uh, fireplaces. And I got up early that morning, it was a beautiful morning, and I saw this little hill out there in front of us, it just kind of felt like a call to, to come up that hill, and so nobody was up, so else was up yet, and, so I started climbing up that hill and I got up to the first tree line and I turned around and looked back and I could see all the, the, the cabins all laid out and the, all the pasture, the fields and stuff because the only way in there was by single engine airplane or boat or, you, or hiking. There was no, no roads in there, no air, air, uh, airport or anything. And, and so it was just an awesome time. And I got there and I thought, oh, what an awesome view. And the Lord says, come up higher. We now know what that means, but back then, I, I was, you know, I was in my 30s back then. And so I climbed a little higher. I climbed about another 20, 30, 40 feet. I don't really know how much. And there was an opening. And again, I turned around and looked back. I could see more. I could see further. And this went on for about three times. It kept going. And I thought this was far, <laughs> far enough. <laughs> you ever feel that in the journey? <laughs> I'm winded, I'm tired, I don't think I can go another further, another step further, but yeah, you can. Keep coming. And I finally kept going to that, and I, I reached the top. And you know what I discovered? There's more on the other side. <laughs> 
And that's what we have to learn. We have to keep climbing and keep climbing. The Lord just says, keep coming and keep coming. You may get a little bit winded, but if you stop and look back at where you've been, all of a sudden it was great. It's a beautiful view, but that was then. This is now. I want to see more. And so we keep climbing. I was saying, as we was worshiping this morning, I, I, I saw this cluster of deep purple grapes, a deep cluster of grapes, just nice, thick cluster of grapes. It was like, it had to be like first light because I didn't see the sun, but I saw the light shining on it. It has that, that morning dew that is on it. It's just, it's just kind of one of those, those pictures that God paints. You know, we can't do We try to capture it, but God painted it. And I thought, that's, that's how God sees it. And we're, we're that close-knit cluster of grapes, you know. And, you know and, and, the, and that's a good sign because it's beautiful and there's sweetness and there's juice. But the downside could be that there's a crushing coming. <laughs> and so we journey and we contend because... We want to experience the glory of God, but, but there's a process, as we learned, that we have to go through to experience that. And we see that in Solomon's temple. Remember, I talked about, I'm not going to reteach or re-preach these things, these messages. I think Dan's got it posted somewhere on, on YouTube. Uh, but there's a process in, in the approach to God, and it starts outside with the, the brazen altar and the brazen laver, and then it comes inside, and there's fellowship. You know, when in fellowship, you got to make sure if you want to move any further in God and you want to experience that glory, you got to make sure that everything is okay between you and each other, between your, you and your spouse, between you and your kids or you and your parents, between one another and the body of Christ because you're not getting any further until you deal with the table, the showbread, the fellowship, the potluck in two weeks kind of gathering. <laughs> I just firmly believe, and I, I, I have always believed that that should be part of every church. And that that and it's not about the food, though we love the food, it's a getting together and just fellowshipping. I think that's what killed the, the ministry, uh, the pastoral gathering, is they removed the potluck fellowship and they just made it another church gathering. I think you need to have a, a balance of all of these things, and it's so important. And then the worship and the and the intercession and stuff like we do at, at, at happening, you know, in the, in the church service. And, 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 and it's then that it wasn't before that. Do you ever notice that when you read the story? There wasn't before that, 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 that Jesus has made center and for that, that approach to God, that journey towards God. It's there when you get there that the glory falls. And then we have the similar thing. If you, you want the fire of God, everybody, we hear that, the, you know, fire and glory. It's, this is everywhere on Facebook. All evangelical Pentecostal churches are talking about the fire of God. They're talking about the glory of God. And they, they want all of these things, but they want it to just fall in the place. And it isn't going to happen that way. I mean, God fell in here in the early days, but he just kind of whetted our appetite for what we could have if we're willing to contend for it. And so we've been contending and we continue to contend for that. But every time it's a journey that, that, that when, when Elijah, to experience the fire of God, the journey, he didn't know where he was going, but he knew God was leading. That's a, and I was interesting, I was talking to the gentleman yesterday about our journey. It's been 25 years. I said, I look at us like, and I think maybe that's what God put in my spirit, like Abraham Abraham walked for, for 25 years, journeyed with the Lord, and the thing that kept him going is he had a promise. It helped him to stand against all opposition and hold his ground and keep moving and keep going forward because he had a promise from God, and that promise that God is faithful concerning his promises towards us, and that, that you hold on to that promise and you keep walking in the right direction and you'll reach the destination and the promise will be full, fulfilled. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, Abraham walked 25 years to that promise. I thought, wait a minute, Lord, this is our 25th day. Down here, Lord, this is our 25th year. We're ready to give birth. We're ready to give birth to that, that great move of God that's going to bring in the harvest of souls. So I think about all of these contendings that we have to do, and I'm not done. In fact, I actually have two more, counting this one, of contending. 
But we like to, you have to have a goal. I mentioned the other day that the that my track coach when running the hurdles said don't look at the hurdles, look at the finish line. That's what we have to keep. We have a goal. We have a we have a finish line as it were uh, while we're down here in the move of God. And so we keep our eyes on that and not on the hurdles because the hurdles will overwhelm you and the hurdles look really big when you look at him. I don't know if I can clear that hurdle, and, uh, uh, but it's amazing what you can do if you keep your eyes on the goal, on the prize, on the, on the end target. So we're gonna, looking at being positioned to receive the anointing. Again, it doesn't just happen. In Zechariah 4, 6, I think we all know this verse. And so the Lord is speaking to Zechariah. He said, this is the word of the Lord. The angel is speaking to, to Zerubbabel. I said Zechariah, I meant Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel had an insurmountable task. I learned a long time ago, being a carpenter, I would rather build a new construction, a new house, than to remodel an old one. To remodel an old one, you don't know what you're getting into until you get into it. And I've found every manner of thing in remodeling old houses. Rot, bad material, stuff not where it should be, out of square, out of level, all kinds of stuff, and it takes a lot more work than doing it right the first time. And Zerubbabel had come back from 70 years of captivity, and the, and the temple is laying in ruin. A lot of people think when they read Nehemiah that, that what Nehemiah was building was, was building the walls of the temple. He was not. When Nehemiah got there, the temple was done. He was building the walls of the city. And so Zerubbabel is looking at this task and all of the challenges of building, kind of like what we're looking at is the, the job, the task of building the church. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm not talking about a four-wall building. I'm talking about the body of Christ made of the born-again believers that assemble together. This is the building, but this is where we assemble, people of like precious faith. We assemble here, but we're the church. We're part of the great universal church. I don't like that word because there is a actually a, what they call a universal church, what is a worldly church. But the church worldwide of born-again believers, and, and, and so... Zerubbabel is looking at this, it's just a pile of rubble, a pile of misplaced stones knocked all over the place. And it looks like it's impossible. This revival looks impossible. Like I read in, the, in this article a while ago, it, it, the task, it seems impossible. But the answer that Zerubbabel had in his day is exactly the same answer that God has for us in our day. What Zerubbabel saw in the temple in the natural is what we see in the church in the spiritual today. It's a mess. He described it really well. And when we stand back, if, if I were to take this piece of paper and it was and this this was actual physical material I would look at that and I said wow there's no way there's no way I do if I could do the Donna whistle I don't know if Dan does that too or not it was hypothetical <laughs> I would just stand on the corner of the lot and I'd let out a whistle and bring the cat not the kitty cats, not the fur babies. <laughs> Bring the cat and just push this stuff out. Get it all out of here. Let's start over. That's kind of the way, way we are in the natural. That's the way I'd like to do many of these jobs. I told when we first moved into the parsonage, I, it was a shack. I'll be honest with you, it was not much more than a shack. It wasn't fit to live in when we moved here. There was no heat. The heater didn't, had one heater and it didn't work. 
and the roof leaked. I mean, it was a mess. And I told my wife, I said, we just bring a cat in, come from the northwest corner and drive it to the southeast corner. Just cat this puppy out of here. Get rid of it. But she had then and still has an idea Never runs out of ideas. I run out of energy. I run out of the pizzazz and, and, or the bucks to do it. But I tease her to this day that her house will be the first house that's going to be measured by the acre and not the square foot. Just keep building on that puppy. Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> and that's what we look at the job, the, the, the task that's at hand and the condition of the church universe across the board, all denominations included. And it looks like an impossible task. But in that moment of time, when Zerubbabel was standing there and looking at that, and probably shaking his head, and wonder how he's going to do this, a word from the Lord came. Don't you love it? when a word from the Lord comes, and it's only as good as your faith to believe it, because we got a lot of words from the Lord. <laughs> and he said this, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If you're going to accomplish the task, if you're going to fulfill the assignment that I have for you to fulfill in your corner of your temple, in your spot on the planet, it's not going to happen by men's doctrines and programs, flashing lights and all of the other things that people bring in. It's not a thing of competition and outdoing one and another. And, and a, it, it's just, just trust me in your corner. Trust me in your space. Let my spirit lead you. And it can be done. I was sharing with the gentleman yesterday. This is our corner of the world. I come in here sometimes when, I, when I'm praying and, and I think about our, our, our city. You know, we got the map of the city. And that all by itself is a tremendous responsibility. And all we see so far in the city, it seems like when you look at it, things aren't getting any better. It's actually getting darker as we see and get all the reports of the stuff that's, that's coming in into our city. And, and it makes the job, if you can use that term, the responsibility and the burden uh, a lot harder. And I look at the city, and then I hold the city up against our county map. And it all of a sudden looks bigger because the numbers of people involved. And, and then you lift that, lift that up, and you put it over the state. And, and, then you, and, and, and it's, it kind of looks a little bit smaller because the state's kind of overshadowing. And then you put it over the nation. And it's like, we just got a little corner. And then I go over to the world map, and there's a little pencil dot of... Clot's gonna, that doesn't even show up. And I look at that and I see the rubble of the church. I see it all falling in ruin all around the place. And I stand back and, and I look at that. And God says, quit looking at the rubble pile and look at the stone. We look at the, the big project and then we look, it's overwhelming, it's hard. But God says, that's okay, I got a crew. I got a team of people that I've been putting together for a number of years now. I've been training them everywhere. I've been preparing them everywhere. And if each one does his part, fits in his place and picks up his stone where he's at, we can get this done. So when I look at... at, at people coming into our town and, and bringing in their occultisms and bringing in their drugs and, and all of the other stuff, their bondages and corruption and all of this stuff. I just look at, wow, God, we're going to need a bigger net <laughs> because our harvest is getting bigger. 
He's just, we don't have to go after him. He's bringing him right here. Oh, back, back to Zechariah 4, 6. Don't get overwhelmed by the problems. Take, the, you know, you take, we watched the other day one of these yard cleaners and he comes into this house. I've never seen a house over, you couldn't even see the house is overgrown with weeds and ivy. There was a stump growing out of the roof of the house. It was so bad. And he goes up and he says underneath it and he takes a shovel and dumps down. He said, there's a patio underneath this. It's just grown over, completely grown over. And he just took, and he went to work, took him two days, all day long. And he went through, but it was not a bad looking patio. Under, when you get the work done, when you clean it off, you take a, he took a, a shovel, then he took a wind blower, then he took a hose. And it come out just three steps and it was done. You see, we get overwhelmed by the size of the project, by the weight of the load. But God hires those who he can trust to do the job, and he then gives us the tools to get that job done. But as we look at the job, at the construction job, and I can see, unless you're willing to wait for another 40 minutes, we'll see how we go. Because I'm still talking about contending. I'm still talking about preparation. I'm still talking about goals, destiny's purpose in all of this. Because if we have no purpose, let's retire. Let's take off our walking shoes and put on our bedroom slippers and, and our nightcaps and let's just go rock in our chairs and, and, and say this is for somebody else. This is for the younger generation. This is for another, you know, another time. I'm not content with that, and I don't think you are either. We just want to be stubborn enough to hang around, still be here and be a part of what God's doing. We want to pick up our stone, our rock, our, our building block, and fit it into place where it's supposed to be, to be a part of the finished project. But in every construction job, the foundation, is the key. If you don't have a foundation, that's why so many people flounder in life. If their foundation isn't in place, that's one of the problems that we have with the parsonage. There's no foundation. It's post. It's just got pier blocks. It depends on what's under that, whether it's going to stand or sink. Hence, there's places that's not level. You can probably roll marbles across it. We don't try because we'll forget to pick them up and then step on them. But there's a, there's a problem. I was called in to do a job at our first church because I, I was leveling houses. When I first called into the ministry, just before that, I was leveling old houses. And they were always a two-story. I don't know why I never had a single-story house. They were all two-story houses. And you ever try to lift a two-story house from below sea level? below the ground level where you got to dig it out, trench it out, and then you got to sit your beams and your jacks underneath and the outside lifts, but the middle won't. So you got to, I, I crawl, I mean, I had to get my mind conditioned right because I had to crawl under a two-story house only held up now by, by jacks on the outside underneath the beams and, and lift the middle because the middle wasn't going. The outside was, and the middle was st stubborn and staying put. So I'm crawling between floor joists. I'm dragging a, 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 a house jack and a steel plate and some beams to span the joists and, and a trowel to dig a hole. And I'm, I'm crawling down between this and I'm thinking, this house is not going to fall. This house is not going to fall. Because <laughs> I knew if this house comes down, nobody knows I'm here. And they wouldn't even know where to look for, them, for me, for my remains. And then started lifting. Sometimes to get the proper foundation in place, you have to redo what was because it was no longer the way it was originally intended. intended. And so I know what it means. I know the value and the importance. I probably, I could say safely, I probably have put in a hundred foundations over the years. That's a lot of foundations. 
if not more. And a lot of them just here in Columbia, Clatsop County, Longview, and then other places. So I know the value and the importance of a good proper foundation. So it is with the church. If your, doc your doctrine is not your foundation, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, and you all know this, he says unto Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And his church, this is so important. We quote this, we know what it says, but I'm not sure we grasp what it says. What he's telling us. He says, I'm going to build, I'm going to do it through you, but it will be me doing it. And it is not yours, it's my church. When we get that understood and clear in our heads, that would help a lot. It would lift a lot of competition and it would break down every denominational wall if we understood this thing is his. It's his building project. He just decided to bring us on board to build it. And when you read back to this, and you read this, and it talks about the condition of the church, why is it that way? Because God didn't build this church. And why did it fall? Because the gates of hell prevailed. Because God says, my church... I'm going to build my church. And it doesn't matter. The gates of hell cannot stop it. They're not going to win. Why do you think the attacks have heated up against the move of God, against, against the church, against believers, against Christians? You're the greatest opposition, opposition. The Republican Party is not the opposition. Donald Trump is not the opposition. You are. The devil just uses all these other things to get at you. Because he wants to stop what God is doing and what God is yet ready, getting ready to do through you. He is leveling his best, but keep in mind, as long as you keep your foundation, as long as you keep your life on that foundation, it doesn't matter what the devil does. For three years, Jesus demonstrated to the disciples and all that followed him what his church is supposed to look like. Talked in the class this morning how the book, if we, if, if we went back to Azusa Street, we look at what the church, what the charismatic Pentecostal church is today and what it was at Azusa Street, you wouldn't even know they were the same. You wouldn't even know they came from the same, same beginnings. They look so different from one another because we have refined it. Man has come in with better ideas and better ways and smoother ways and more comfortable ways and more tolerant ways and, and so we put up and, and pounded in and we brought in all of this, all of this man-made doctrines and ideas and, and all of these things and competition and, and trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and do it this way and that and all of the things that attract the flesh. What's the devil used to attack us? The devil uses your flesh. He'll take, that's what he uses. And so, you, you know, we got it all backwards. We got it all wrong. But if we take it back to the real foundation, Azusa Street is not the foundation of the Pentecostal church. Azusa Street, or, or the upper room, the Pentecost. But all Pentecost is doing is taking the Jesus life and transmitting it into their own to be expressed out through them to the world. And I say, where has that life gone? What, what happened to that church? And so today we, we stand there and, and it seems like we're looking at a stack of rubble. 
and we don't know how to put it together. It's in the sense, like we've talked about, and I've used the expression before, like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces are there. It's just getting them back into the right places so that they function properly because it would look terrible having the window on the bottom and the door on the top. Or building the walls up and having no way to access. So it's taking the pieces, taking the, the blueprint and getting those pieces and piece A connects to piece B, A1 to B1 or however they look and they do all of those things in the manuals. It's not a, an impossibility if we quit. I, I, my mind just goes back, and I've used again this. I, I'm just getting at that place. I've got no fresh illustrations of you know, personal experiences, so relive some of the old ones, and it comes to the point. I'll just number them all, and I'll just say number seven, and you'll know what the illustration is, and you can all applaud, cheer, or clap, or laugh, whatever it is, because you'll know them all so well. But it goes back when we lived, when we first started our first year in our first senior pastorate position. And we're in the parsonage. Later we sold apart the house, they moved it off the property and we, we had to turn, turn it into a parking lot because we needed more parking space. But I can still remember this. Ray Hammer helped and, and I'd bought a swing set for the kids. Dan was just a little baby, he wasn't even old enough to sit in a swing yet, wasn't big enough. Uh, are you there yet? <laughs> and, and so we got this swing set and I opened the box and I look at all of these parts and I said, this looks easy. These two go together, the legs, and well, there's this, that looks long enough, that's the cross, and we went through and we, we just put that all together and we got all done and there were three pieces left. Well, nobody's looking, I'm going to chuck them away. <laughs> That's what we try to do. So after the fact, after I did with using my own knowledge, my own wisdom, remember in, print, in brackets, my name's Dumber, so I keep that in brackets as a fallback, you know. And, and so we decided, let's, we got a piece here, and I don't know where it goes, and Let's look back here at the blueprints that they send us at the instruction manual. <laughs> they didn't send us extra parts. We just didn't know where to go. And sometimes you have to take one piece out of the wrong place and move it to the right place so that you can put the right piece where the wrong piece was. And when we got it all done, we sat back feeling, we did that. Well, guess what, folks? When we follow the blueprints, and he builds his church by his instruction manual, using us to accomplish the task, when we get it all put together and it's all done, he's going to look at us and say as we go through the door, good job. Well done. You stayed with it. You did it right. You finished the job. You see, there's a call, there's a purpose for the body of Christ. We're not an entertainment center. We're an equipment center. We're a training center to release the body of Christ. To do what? Join forces with Jesus. Because he said he's going to build. He's going to build his church. We sing that song, it's your church, it's your church. Build it from the ground up, it's your church. Kind of a goofy rhythm for, you know, for, for me to for a song. But it has a powerful truth that we have to remind ourselves of. In John 14, 9... I'm going to wrap this down because I've got a long ways to go yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> and that was wrong. If that's on tape, that was my wife. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the pastor was just preaching away, preaching his heart off. And his son comes up with a note from his wife and hands it to him, and he quickly looks at it, and, and he said, wow, she's romantic in the middle of this message. She just says, just says kiss. Oh, you know, wow, that's awesome. She told him later that wasn't the, that wasn't a kiss. That meant keep it short, stupid. <laughs> Sometimes you can say a lot with less words to get your point across. I'm talking about me, not what she said. Jesus said in John 14, 9, he says, I've been with you so long yet, talking to, to Philip, that you've not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? So hold Jesus, if we understand that and we read the Gospels and we, we see Jesus' life because he was the demonstrator of how, the, how it's supposed to be done. When I, was, when I was a kid, I grew up, you know, fixing jigsaw puzzles. I love to fix jigsaw puzzles. My wife does too, she still does it. She has a, a site on her Facebook or whatever it is, on a puzzle site, a game site, with fixing jigsaw puzzles on it. But my dad was an odd duck. This is one of those places I hope heaven isn't looking down. <laughs> or at least my dad. No disrespect, dad love you. But he had this quirk about him on how things are. So when he fixed the puzzle, the lid was always upside down and the box was in it. And we couldn't do anything. All the pieces had to be turned over. Man, you ought to see that when it's a, a thousand piece puzzle. You can't get them all on a card table. So we would use our carom board and we'd, put it, we'd take two kitchen chairs back to back, space them and set the carom board on top of that and pull it up next to the card table. And, and you can't put colors together. You just have to turn those pieces over where they are. You can't pick out edge pieces. You just turn them over where they are. And when everything is turned over and it's all laid out, now we can start fixing a puzzle. And so we're doing this, and then we're turning over. Look, we're looking for, for the edge pieces. And so we can get the edge piece. And you cannot put two pieces together outside the puzzle. If they don't connect, leave them alone. There's a good message in this, you know. <laughs> Wait until they connect. Wait until you build out that far. You can't build a house or a horse or a, or a bridge out here and then lift the whole thing up and put it in the middle. But on top of all of that, we never got to see what we were doing. We never got to see the picture. So it was blind. We didn't know what was in that until we got done. I mean, it sounds insane. <laughs> I think God left, left my dad's mansion together for him to put together up there. <laughs> but in the kingdom, in building the church, he put the picture out right at the beginning. We already know what the picture is supposed to look like. We know what the finished product is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like Jesus. We're, we're supposed to look like Jesus. We're supposed to act like Jesus. We're supposed to talk like Jesus. We're supposed to operate like Jesus. That's, that's what the church is supposed to do. That's what the church is supposed to be. 
And so when he prayed, as I've referred to this in, in, the, in the classroom, then John 17, you know, because we always refer to our Father which art in heaven as the Lord's Prayer, but that wasn't the Lord's Prayer. That was the disciples' prayer because they said, Lord, teach us to pray the kind of prayer that you prayed that gets the kind of results that you get. And Jesus said, pray after this manner. But if you want to know what the Lord's Prayer was, he praying his heart, his prayer was, I would that they would be one as I and the Father are one. I and you and you and me and us and them. I mean, that was the whole thing. Let's get this puzzle together. We have, a, we have a picture of what this thing's supposed to look like individually and corporately. But it's all of us focused on the same end goal. All of us seeing the same picture. It's, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Him. Because that's the one that the devil can't stop. He can attack and attack and attack, but it's going to stand because it's got a sure foundation under it. And we got hurricane brackets and earthquake brackets. Man, oh man, I never ran into that until I built the Alston Corner Church for them. That's the first building I built in all the new codes. And all the metal straps you had to do but it's not bad spiritually because they have a strap that comes about four feet up the wall and it goes down into the foundation and it angles like this and then it has a hook under like this and the rebar goes through this in the footing it hooks under the footing and that rebar goes so it's anchored to the footing of the build of that building it goes clear through the stem wall into the footing under the steel and then bolted or nailed to the wall and these are positioned on every corner both sides of every corner and different places depending and even on the inside that's a church that's going to stand the weather that's what God wants anchor yourself we sing I've anchored in Jesus the storms of life I'll brave I've anchored in Jesus I'll fear no wind or wave we sing it, but the first little breeze, oh! <laughs> God doesn't love me. He doesn't, he's just going to let me go out there and go drown. Wait a minute. It's only ankle deep. <laughs> we don't handle stuff very good, do we? You forgot you got a foundation under you that can't be shaken. No earthquake, no hurricane, no atom bomb is going to shake it. He said everything that can be shaken shall be shaken. His church can't be shaken. It will not come down. I don't care how much the devil huffs and puffs and blows. He's not blowing this house down. He's not blowing this house down. Because you have a builder and a maker who's God. Stand to your feet. I hope you had as much fun listening to that as I had preaching it. And I haven't even got to the message yet. <laughs> I'm still laying the foundation of where we're going. I, I'm just going to, everybody get up here into the altar space a minute because if we're talking about foundation, we're talking about building blocks and, and, and cornerstones, let's connect these blocks together. You're all apart, you're all connected, like it or not. Well, I don't want to stand next to that one. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's the very one you need to be standing next to. The one that you're struggling with the hardest is the one you need to be standing next to because that's probably the one that's going to keep you standing upright. They're going to challenge you. They're going to challenge everything that you believe. They're going to challenge your love level. They're going to challenge the level of your grace, your mercy. Everything that's spiritual is challenged by everybody around you. Get used to it. Welcome to planet Earth. God is changing you, shaping you, and equipping you. Interlock. 
Interlock. There you go. Interlock. I would play Red Rover, Red Rover, but I know they would hit Don over there on the crutches. <laughs> God is building an awesome house here. Mm -hmm. A strong group of believers that your feet are cemented on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. He's level. He's plumb. He's squared away. And you know, if you stay, keep your feet on Him, you will not stumble or fall. Because he is your rock. So, Father, I thank you for this people, for what you're doing in their lives individually, but also, Lord, how miraculously you're doing it in us corporately. You're fitly framing us, connecting us together, making a sure house on a sure foundation. Because in the finished project, your spirit, your glory, your fire will be in this place. Not that they aren't now, but not to the degree that you're preparing us for. So I pray, God, your people would be encouraged today. They would be strengthened today. They would have more determination than they've had before. Their faith would be built. And like the song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So Lord, I pray your blessing upon their lives, blessings in their comings and goings. Bless them in their labor, their leisure, their rising up and their laying down. May their homes be a sanctuary where your, your spirit is pleased to dwell. May your grace, peace, and love be manifested in all of our lives at all times with all people. So I bless your people. I bless the body of Christ individually and corporately today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.